the tutor was excellent, but I found that when I went to a Thai class and it's all oral, it's so hard because there's a lot to remember. Whereas if I can look after the class at the notes, I get it. And so I think reading really is the way for me. And my interest is, as Alex said, to be immersed in the culture, but also when I travel outside of Bangkok mm. and English is less widely spoken, ordering food becomes a problem because um, I like particular types of food and mm. it, it just gets difficult. So here I am. I, I've never been to Thailand before. I became interested in the whole idea of becoming a, a digital nomad thing about three, four years ago. So I went on this kind of quest to find some sustainable work. And about a year ago, I was fortunate enough to, to find work like that that I enjoy. I work about three to four hours a day, make enough income to be able to ideally live this kind of lifestyle. I, I'd like to learn Thai because I really like connecting with people. And so I'd want to connect with locals. I want to. I don't want to go there and feel like a stranger in a strange land and feel kind of alienated. The only effort that it takes, I think, is just sitting down. Probably this course is going to be as difficult as like sitting down for three hours at a time, if it's anything like the online course. So uh, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks, so yeah, it's a matter of doing the time. And you're right. Once you can read and start to speak Thai, suddenly a whole new world just opens up, which which is right there in front of us, but we just can't see it because you know we can't access it. I bought the course and I found it really amazing. You know, I'm really interested in mnemonics and so on. And in retrospect, I should have applied myself more to the tone. So I just get a kick out of figuring out the puzzle of the language. Like everyone else here, I just want to be more immersive in the culture. So I think that's the biggest takeaway for me. I've been in Thailand for a little over seven years, and believe it or not, it's very easy to live in Chiang Mai and not speak a lick of Thai. I tried to learn Thai and run a business at the same time, and my brain just couldn't handle it. So now is my time to really dig in, and I really want to immerse myself in it. You know, I'll take my time. I don't want to get overwhelmed. I know when, if I get overwhelmed, I end up just scrapping the whole thing. So this is my time to actually learn how to speak Thai and learn what's going on around me and have a whole new experience about living here. You haven't tried to learn Thai from a Thai class or anything, have you? Many times, yes. Oh. <laughs> and then I just get overwhelmed because I'm trying to you know, run this business and right. I just quit. So I do have some background. I do have some skills, but you know, I'm just going to see it through this time. It's better if you start from zero or skip, yeah. scratch, actually, because anything you've learned before is, is just confusing. No problem. Uh, and you've got to throw it away. So I hope the best if you forget it. And if you've already forgotten it, that's perfect. <clears throat> sure. I've been in Bangkok now around five or six years I think similar to a lot of the other guys that I've tried many courses like to speak and I just thought that I can't it's impossible for me I'm too stupid right (laughs) since I went on your course like it just seems to click a little bit better when I'm trying to read I don't know what I'm reading obviously but I just feel like there's some progress there and I really want to be included with like my Thai friends (laughs) when they're sitting around talking and I just look like I know what's going on, but I haven't got a clue. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was the experience I had also in the beginning. It just felt so you know, isolating to be. I feel like I'm a bit of a burden when we're out. It's like, and then one person just tries to explain to me and I'm like, just think it's time I commit to it and really try. And I think like one of the other guys said, do it in small bits so it doesn't become overwhelming because I just quit every time I start something because if I don't see any progress, I just give up. Last weekend, I celebrated my eighth wedding anniversary to my Thai wife and having the same conversation with her, her parents for eight and a half years, which is basically, hello, how are you? And then they'll offer me some food. I am uh, I run a migration law practice for people heading to Australia, but I also sit on the board of directors for the Australian Thai Chamber of Commerce. And recently, I've been having more meetings with high level government officials and deputy prime ministers and things. And it is a bit stupid turning up to those meetings and not understanding anything that's going on. So I thought it's about time that I actually got my act together. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you know, I won't bore you with my background details. I've been doing research in learning and think learning complicated. If it works for me, as the lowest common, uh, the, the fact that I'm not good at languages is a distinct advantage. In fact, I've discovered the opposite is that those people who are very good at languages or very academic or very smart tend not to like my method because it's not academic enough and it's not linguistic enough and it's not correct enough. The rapid method I devised because for me, the most difficult part of learning a language was remembering things. Somebody can tell you something, you can go to a class and say, you know, this is how you say something. These are the words you need to say it. While I'm still in the class, 
10 minutes later, uh, we'll practice what we've just been taught and forgot it all already. And then, especially if you run along to the next lesson and the next lesson, and the next lesson, and you've now got 100 words and you've got 25 sentences. There's two things I did. One is I looked at the Thai language. Basically, I took the basic textbooks and I stripped out anything that I thought wasn't important. And in fact, we are going to not learn things that you don't need to know. There are, there are a number of obsolete letters. I'm not even going to mention them. I'm just going to tell you they are there. And because they're not important anymore, I'm not going to show them to you. So just don't need to know them. And the second thing I did is I looked for ways to remember the bits that were important. How to remember the letters. There are just so many letters. There's, depending how you count, it's 70 letters. And they all look the same. And, and how do you tell the difference? Even if you're a Thai person, Thai people spend a, a year or two years as, as little kids going through the alphabet every single day. I was living outside a nursery school in Bangkok. And at 8.30 in the morning for, for 20 minutes, they are shouting the alphabet, go, guy, do, de, go, da, da, whatever it is. <laughs> and the thing is, they know the letters, but they don't know how to apply them. I mean, we have the same problem in English. If you learn ABC, uh, and then I say to you, okay, now spell C-A-T. You look at a word that says C-A-T. How, how would you pronounce that? Siati, right? How do you get from Siati to cat? Thai people have the same sort of problem. When we as foreigners look at this mass of letters and then learn them with English sounds, it means nothing to us. It's just a collection of random squiggles. For me, I realized that I've got to somehow find a way of connecting the shape of the letter with its sound. And so what I did is I created these various pictures, which were derived from the shape of the letter, and then used mnemonics and stories to help me to remember what the sound of the letter, because that's all I cared about. I, I didn't want to know the name of the letter. I didn't want to know it as A, B, C, H, for instance. Where does H get you in English? How do you pronounce the word H? You pronounce it CH, right? The same thing with Thai. What's most important about the Thai letters is what does it sound like and how to remember the difference between these three letters. At the moment, they kind of look different because they're different pictures. But if you look at the original letters, three letters that look kind of identical, right? Totally different sounds. D, D, and K. But by creating a picture based on its shape, it's relatively easy to remember. This is the doubled over fakir. So it's a D sound. This is the same doubled over fakir, but this time with a sagging stomach. That, 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 like that, that in stomach. That, that, that. And this is a ladyboy carrying a prickly cactus. So it's a, it's a curt sound. Go through all the letters and we'll show you the story behind each shape. And that's how you got to learn Thai with the rapid method. The, the most important thing is to look at the shape of the letter and to remember its picture. Once you've done that, everything else follows. It, uh, there's two things that you need to know about a picture. One is what is the sound of that letter and what is the sex of that letter? You all know the difference between a consonant and a vowel right? But essentially, in terms of the physicality, and I'll get back to the physicality, the physicality is that consonants are something you do in your mouth to stop the sound. It's a bit like when you're starting a sprint, you have like a starting block. So a consonant is a starting block and it's something you do in your mouth. You either close your lips or you, you, you press your tongue against your teeth or you shut down your tongue down the back of your mouth. But something that, that, that you press down on as a launching pad for the vowel. And the vowel is simply your mouth being open. You open your mouth and you make a sound. If I were to start with a D, for instance, mm. I'm shutting off the sound, mm. acting as a, a launching pad. And then I'm opening a mouth into, into whatever the vowel is, the shape for the vowel. And I'm making a sound. Da, do, whatever it is. That's going to be quite important when we come back to that later on. The sex of the letter. In Thai, I created three sexes to group the consonant letters. The consonants have sex, vowels don't have sex. So the consonant letters are either boys, girls, or lady boys. And the reason why we need to group the consonants into those three different sexes is that when we come to the tones, the sex of the letter determines what the tone is going to be. So you kind of have to know what the sex of the letter is before you get to the tones. But it's actually not that difficult. The reason why I came up with sexes is that there are three types of consonant letters, and I needed a way to distinguish one from the other. And because there were three, first of all, I started with something like colors, you know, green, blue, red. That kind of turned out to be a bit meaningless. And then I thought, oh, hang on a sec. German has der, die, das, which is, again, three sexes. It's masculine, feminine, and neuter. 
And then I thought, oh, we're in Thailand. So rather than having male, female, and neuter or animals or something, and I thought, let's make the third sex the ladyboys, because that is what the third sex is in Thailand. The rest went downhill from there. <laughs> I just basically followed the idea down the rabbit hole, as it were. I'm going to be mentioning the sex as we go through the course and deal with each of the letters. And the story that is associated the, and the visuals that is associated with each shape will give you the sex. But it's something you've got to pay attention to. So you don't really have to make too much of an effort to try to memorize it, but pay attention to it. Most of the Thai letters are ladyboys, which means that you only really have to pay particular attention to which are the girls and boys. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven girls. and one, I, I group them together because more or less the same shape. One, two, three, four, five and a half. I think these are very obscure letters. Five and a half boys. That's it. Six girls, five and a half boys. And if we pay attention to which letters are boys and girls, then if you can't re really remember the story for one of these ladyboy letters, then it doesn't matter. You just say, oh, it's not a boy or a girl, so it must be a ladyboy. Uh, the other thing I do with the ladyboys, I tend to make them uh, kind of depraved, uh, sexual party animals. They'll go out at night, they get sickly, they get hungover. She do become quite memorable <laughs> in their own right. <laughs> the girls are, are usually sporty, healthy people, but they tend to be quite vain, stick things in their hair, or they look at themselves in the mirror. It helps you to remember that they're girls. And the boys are kind of lost farts who don't know where they are. There's a U-boat captain, uh, there's a ram, which is obviously a male. There's an Indian fakir who does, this is a cockerel. In America, you call it a rooster. It's a male chicken. Now, the reason why I call it a cockerel is because it's got the k sound. But if you're American and you don't know what a cockerel is, then it's a rooster. It's a male chicken. It's got the k sound as in chicken, the, the kind of k inside a word in English. All right, so that's the background. Let's deal with the dreaded tones. This is something I'm, I'm doing different from what I've done with the previous courses. Is I, I kind of left the tones out and I said, oh, let, we'll bother about the tones later. But actually, I've discovered from the feedback is that if you leave it till later, because most of us are procrastinators, that's why we don't manage to learn difficult subjects like Thai. <laughs> so I am now going to take myself and your, your cells in hand and say, no, we're not going to procrastinate on this issue. We're going to do it first. We are going to do the tones right from the beginning and do them every single time over and over and over again until they become boring and trivial and easy. There are essentially two tones, actually, but each of those two tones have a slight little kink or variant to it. And they're the same tones we have in English. Right? Right. All right. You got it? You sure? Positive. Yeah. yeah. Now, I want to show you a little sentence just to illustrate this. There are two ways of saying that in English, which give them opposite meanings. Does somebody want to have a go at just saying it? I didn't think it was so expensive. Okay. Now, say it another way where it means the opposite. I didn't think it was so expensive. Perfect. All you did was change the tone yeah. or the tonality. That's it. So how is it that in English, the same sentence in writing can mean two opposite things, just depending on change of tone. So when people say, oh, you have a Thai as a tonal language, and every word has a different meaning depending on the tone, yes, English is also a tonal language. The first group of tones, I'm going to call them question tones. So in English, when you ask a question, there's, there's two ways of asking a question. There's either when you're genuinely curious, you say something like, are you fine? How are you? Why? How? Can you hear what I, what I did? There's a kind of an inflection somewhere. Uh, and I know in Thai, you might have heard, or those of you who have attended a class, things like frequency graphs, rising, falling, high, low. It's kind of like that, but it's not how we speak. In fact, this is how I did it in the beginning. I was very, very careful to speak with a musical tone in Thai, and nobody could understand what I was saying. So, for instance, if I were to say, if I were to have a conversation with you about your business, then you would find it very hard to understand what I'm saying. And, and that's how I probably sounded like to a Thai person, saying every single word super accurately with the right tone, rising it, falling it, making it high, making it low. And I, I've discovered since that when we make the tones in English, we do it naturally. It just comes right. 
we've got to identify what that feeling is when we ask a question, for instance. If I say, are you fine? Why? You make a particular sound in a particular way, and you need to, in a sense, memorize that muscular feeling or activity, and then simply plop it onto a Thai word that has that same tone. And that's why I call that the question tone. So when we have words that have question tones, what you've got to do is to get the English way of making a question tone and then saying the Thai word with that exact same tonality. For me, I say, are you fine? And the fine is the question tone for me, but everybody's slightly different. For instance, some people, when they say why, they say why, which is not quite the same. So let's just go through and ask some sort of question. And let me see if I can hear you say the right tone. So up at the top here, Darren, say how or why, or are you fine? How? how? Why yeah. did you do that? Okay. That's what I call a skeptical question. Try this. I mean, it, it might, it, it probably works, might work for everybody. Say, say, are you fine? Are you fine? Okay. Fine is the question tone for you. Now the word for two and the word for three are question words. So the word for two is song and the word for three is Sam. So the way to practice that is to go, are you fine? And then you replace the fine with the song. Are you song? Are you Sam? Uh, Darren, can you try that? Are you, are you Sam? Are you song? Yeah, that's it. You, you now know how to do the, the question tone. Mark. Are you okay? Okay. And now I'll say, now this, do the same thing with song and Sam. Are you song? Are you Sam? Are you song? Are you Sam? Right, you've got the question tone. Why are tacos so delicious? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I want to get that kind of very curious. It's a curious way of asking okay. a question. You know, how, why? Why, Sam? Perfect. Arman. Are you drinking tea? Are you song? Are you Sam? Okay, that's a good one for you. Are you drinking tea? <laughs> so that's your go-to phrase for getting the getting getting to the question tone. Are you okay? Are you Sam? Are you Song? Okay, that's a little bit of an uncertain question. And, and, and that's the other variant that we're going to deal with. Try to find something that's a bit more curious rather than worried. How? Song? Sam? Yeah, perfect. The next tone is what I call the uncertain tone. So the uncertain one, that's when you're skeptical or you're uncertain or you're not really sure. You're asking a question, but you're kind of expecting a negative answer. So something like, really? Are you okay? In a sense, you kind of got to scrunch up your face and squeeze your eyes and feel the uncertainty. Something like, what? And in fact, that's how you pronounce the Thai word, what? Which is a temple. So for me, what is the go-to word, what? And as soon as you say, what? Then I can apply that to a Thai word, which has this skeptical question tone. So let's go around the room and try that. Start off by saying, what? 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 And what? I'll give you another Thai word that has question tone. Here's a typical one. Leo means do something already. Leo. Leo. Yeah, exactly. Notice what happened. His face kind of moved forward a bit. Like you're trying to quite hear properly the first time. Well, what, what, what's that you said? Leo. And that's what we do naturally. When we're not sure and we want you to confirm, then we kind of do that. What? Yeah. Do the same thing with Leo. Leo. Yeah. Perfect. Joe. Are you sure? Yeah. Now say Leo. Leo. Yeah. And what? What? Yeah. Perfect. Simon. What? Leo. <laughs> okay. This is easy, I think, for everybody. So the other tone is what I call the emphatic tone. There's other synonyms that you could use. I've created this table of terminology, and I'm going to use the ones in red, but you can use any other description that suits you. So what I call the emphatic tone is usually something that is energetic. It's definitely kind of a, there's an oomph to it. When you're excited about something or when you're being melodramatic, you put a lot of power into what you're saying. So if I were to say, yeah, or great, or super, fantastic, wonderful, it's useful to physically make a fist and, and kind of punch the air and say, yeah, great stuff. So the word for five, in fact, is ha. It's embarrassing for us because we have to kind of uh, put a bit of energy into it. But we do actually use this in English anyway. We use what's called stress. For instance, Simon, you run a company, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I might have a company. Yeah, that's what I said, a company. It, it doesn't have a lot of assets. 
Luckily, I have lots of assets. <laughs> right, there we go. So, and that's the other thing I've discovered about Thai and English is that as native speakers, as listeners, we have an expectation of how something should sound. And we're waiting for that. So when people speak indistinctly, as long as they are speaking in the way we expect them to speak, we can understand them. But if you speak in any way that's unexpected, and that's what happens when I'm speaking Thai, is that I'll be speaking in, in a way that's reasonably accurate, but not quite the way that it should sound like to a native speaker. And I could say it three or four times and they still don't know what I'm saying. And then another Thai person will come along and say exactly what I've just said. <laughs> yes, he's talking about his, his company assets. Oh, you a company assets. Yeah, that's what I said. So what we need to do is to make sure we practice saying the sounds as expected. So that's really one of the reasons why most of us don't learn Thai or any language properly, is that we have this internal way of hearing the sounds using our own language from English, especially if you've got transliteration. You know, you're using the transliteration sounds and you're using your English sounds. From the very beginning, we need to practice the physicality of getting the sound right. Even though this is a reading course, the reading is really just a, a vehicle to getting the sound right. And reading is a vehicle to becoming conversational. And it just so happens that as a side effect, we will become literate. So that's a wonderful thing to learn, but that wasn't the original intention. The original intention was to be able to communicate colloquially and have conversations in Thai. And I discovered that I couldn't do that until I knew how to read first. Can't do that until you know how to pronounce the words accurately. And we're going to be learning how to read Thai in the same way as you learn a musical instrument or learn a sport. You've kind of drilled it over and over and over again until it becomes like a subconscious or automatic reflex, a muscle reflex, rather than an intellectual knowledge of what the sound is. Can we just go around and give me the number five? Ha! Ha! Yeah, Mark. Ha! Ha! Uh, give, give us a bit more energy. Ha! That's it. Now, the other two tones are monotones. Most of the time, Thais speak in a monotone. And in fact, we as English speakers hardly ever speak in a monotone. In fact, I've just done it now. We in English hardly ever speak in a monotone. In English, we do two things at the end of a sentence. We either drop our voice, if you've been confident, or we have this kind of uncertain squeak when we're not sure. One of the things that you learn in speech training is to learn how to drop your voice at the end of a sentence so that it makes you sound confident. So the monotone, there's two variants. One is just keep your voice very, very flat and level and hold it at that level. And that's the hard part to do because we instinctually, in English, we want to either drop our voice or lift our voice at the end of a phrase. And in fact, what you do in Thai, and, and I notice Thai people do this, is that they kind of stretch out the sound a fraction of a second or maybe even as long as a second longer so that the listener automatically can hear that it's a, a monotone sound. So like the word computer, printer, ma, it's a slightly elongated, stretched out way of speaking so that you can hear that nothing's happening. <laughs> monotone is, is hard. So let's take a Thai word that is a monotone. Nan. Nan means a long time. Ma. Come for a long time. Ma. Nan. And then finally, the, the other variant of the monotone is a sad sound. So you've got to kind of feel a bit depressed and you do drop your voice. So it is, a, it is what they call the low tone. And it, yeah, it is a low tone, but it's a monotone. Morning, Pooh Bear. If it is a good morning, which I doubt. Did I get your tail back on properly, Eeyore? No matter. <laughs> there you are. It's an awful nice tail, Kanka. Much nicer than the rest of me. Okay, sad tone. Speak like Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> the way I distinguish between the regular monotone and the sad tone is something like, oh dear. The O is one level. And the deer is at a lower, sadder level. Those are the tones. They are English tones. You have to practice getting to the tone correctly. And then once you've got the tone that you can usually say naturally anyway, except maybe for the monotones, which are maybe not so natural, then 
once we know what the tone is for the Thai word, we just apply it to that Thai word.